Again, let me say it's good to see everyone out. As we continue our journey through the book of Acts, we are staying in chapter 20 today. Here. We're staying in chapter 20 as last week we saw an eventful day in uh, Troas. As an individual named Eutychus fell asleep in the window, he fell out of that window and he passed away and ultimately Paul brought him back to life. And that would be a very eventful day if that occurred for all of us. And so as we continue on in our study this morning, the actual passage we're going to look at begins in verse 13, where Paul departs from Troas, and he goes through an area and by sea, and notice it says they came to, in verse 15, they came to Miletus, and in verse 16, and you have to wonder why this took place. The passage says that Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so he would have time to spend in Asia. For he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem if possible on the day of Pentecost. You notice Paul made a conscious decision to bypass one of the congregations that he established of the Lord's church in Ephesus. But I believe his passing by and deciding not to stop was honorable. Perhaps if Paul had stopped at Ephesus, he would have had to dwell another day or another uh, Pentecost, another Sunday, if you will. He would have had to stay away from Jerusalem. His desire was to be in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And so he bypassed Ephesus. But as he bypassed Ephesus in the hurry to reach Jerusalem, Paul did something that is commendable. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. He calls the elders of the congregation of Ephesus to come for a reason. And he is going to give a discourse. He's going to talk about some things in the past, some things about the future, and then ultimately he's going to give them a warning about what is certain to take place. And so we're going to break our lesson down this morning into these three points. Number one, Paul reviewed his history. And as he called those gentlemen, the elders from Ephesus, together, you begin reading exactly where Brother Malik read from this morning in verse 18. You notice that it says that they came and he said to them, you know. In other words, he's trying to stimulate their memory. He's trying to get them to understand what he had done for them from the very first day that they had met with him. He goes on and he says, in what manner I have always lived among you. Brethren, these elders at Ephesus were familiar with Paul's manner of life. And as you continue reading, he's going to describe his manner of life to them. In verse 19, where he says that he served the Lord with all humility. I want you to make sure you grasp and you understand what Paul is trying to tell these brethren when he says that he had served with all humility. Paul will admit in other places in his writings that he was the chief of all sinners, right? When you think about Paul, as we studied him several weeks ago, when he was still Saul, think about the life that he was living before he became a Christian. A total turnaround, wasn't it? He went from being the one who was prosecuting to being the one who was being, uh, excuse me, from being the one who persecuted to being the one who was being persecuted. 
He's on his way, getting ready to go through a great deal of persecution. But you notice he tells those men, he says, I served with all humility. I believe Paul understood the concept of humility when the light shined before him as he was on the road to Damascus. When the Lord appeared to him and said, Saul, I don't want you to be a persecutor anymore. I want you to be a pro proclaimer of the truth. And because of that, Paul began to serve with a life of humility. You remember he says he counts all things what? For loss. But for the gospel. Paul didn't worry about it. That's humility, brother. Paul was lowering his own self to be a servant of the Lord. But you continue reading and keep going. Verse 19 at the end of the verse. Notice he goes on. He says many tears, trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And you remember, when he was the persecutor, the Jews were what? 100% behind him. They were like, uh, if, if, think about uh, if your high school did this. The big game was coming up on Friday night. And the last period of the day, you would be so happy because they said, we're going to have a pep rally today. And you would go into the gym and the football team would be sitting out on the floor of the, of, of the gymnasium and you would all be sitting there in the stands and the cheerleaders would come out and they would give a cheer and you would join in. You were offering the players encouragement to go out and defeat your arch rival. Picture that with Paul. Or Saul. Picture the Jews being that pep rally, cheering him on, encouraging him to continue to persecute the Christians. But now all of a sudden, he's not the persecutor anymore. And so because these Jews in their minds say, you have turned your back on us, you have gone over to the dark side, as we would say today, they began to persecute him. They began to put him through many trials. And he's calling that to the attention of the Ephesian elders saying, remember what I have gone through. He talks about how he has served them at Ephesus. Even while he was in Ephesus, he underwent many trials and tribulations. But then not only does he talk about his service at Ephesus, he goes a little bit further and he talks about his teaching at Ephesus. He talks about the message that he proclaimed to those Ephesian brethren. And you will notice in the next verses, verse 20 and 21, he says he kept back nothing that was helpful. Did you catch that? Nothing. Uh, I kept back nothing that was helpful. In other words, what he did is he was proclaiming the things that would be beneficial, which was the whole counsel of God. But Bobby, I appreciate that in your prayer. Because that was Paul. That ought to be the goal of every preacher of the gospel is to proclaim the whole counsel. Paul said, I didn't hold anything back. I think about this. Did Paul, in his writings, in other places, did he hold back or did he call sin, sin? When something was said, he called it out. He, that's what he's telling these men. He said, I, when something was wrong, I pointed it out to you. He says, not only did I hold nothing back. He said, but I taught you publicly and privately. Brother Paul went not only in public, but he went from house to house confirming what he had taught in public. I have a good friend of mine. He left, oh, it's been a week ago. He and his whole family, his wife, two sons, and two daughters, 
They're spending their entire summer in Tanzania. His wife posted a picture of him on Friday. He had his backpack on and he was going from house to house. And then she posted a picture this morning and they were publicly assembled to worship God. He's exemplifying this passage. Paul said, I took every opportunity to teach. And then in verse 21, I taught both Jew and Gentile. I didn't hold the message back from anyone. I wasn't discriminatory in who deserved to have the message. It was both for Jew and Gentile. And notice what his message was. His message was repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. Paul taught the importance of repentance and he taught the importance of having faith in Christ. Well, when you think about repentance, did Jesus teach about repentance? Did he not say in Luke chapter 13, both verse 3 and verse 5, repent or you will perish. But after he spoke about repentance, did he not also teach us that we must remain and live a faithful life in service to him? Did he not teach a message of we must be obedient to the word of God? Paul was simply doing as he had been instructed by Christ. I used the passage at 6 a.m. this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Why don't you flip over there? I'll give this to you this morning. I won't charge you anything extra. But notice Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Paul's message to the Jews, to the Gentiles, in the public and from house to house was repentance and faith. He imitated his Lord and his Savior. But secondly, this morning, as you transition on down from, from verse uh, 22 following, down through verse 27, you will notice that Paul begins to speak of his future. He speaks about this journey that he is on to Jerusalem in verse 22. He says he goes bound in the Spirit. What does that mean that he was bound in the Spirit? I believe what Paul is telling us at this point is it doesn't really matter what happens to me physically because I'm bound by the Spirit of God. He understood that no matter what happened to him physically, could not take away for what was going to happen for him eternally. That's being bound in the Spirit. That's having the true understanding of what God has for in store for us if we are, as Paul was, faithful and true. And you'll even notice that he says at the end of verse 22, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Paul didn't know for sure what was going to happen. But yet he what? He went anyway. He went anyway. I used this uh, illustration. I don't remember what day it was, what, what service it was. But if I were to ask you tonight, or this morning, tonight, it feels like night to me. If I was to ask you this morning, if you knew you were going to be in a fatal car accident this afternoon, on your way home from worship services and you knew for a fact that something was going to happen, how many of you would have jumped in your automobile and came to worship anyway? And if you answered the question, I would have, you have the faith that Paul had. Because Paul says, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I'm going to go anyway. That's how we have to live our life as he speaks about this journey to Jerusalem. Look at verse 23. 
where he says, I don't know what will happen. He says, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await. Paul says, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I know because the Spirit has told me that chains and tribulations await me. I'm not exactly sure, but I know something's going to happen. But did you notice as he speak, continues speaking in verse 24? Nothing moved him. Nothing swayed him from not going to Jerusalem. Even though he knew something was going to happen, he says, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going anyway. You see, Paul wanted at the end of of the verse 24. Notice it says, So that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, I don't care what's going to happen. I want to finish the race. And we can confirm that he finished the race, can we not? As he writes to our young brother Timothy, remember what he says? I have finished the race. He fought the good fight. Brother Paul can say with all certainty, even as he was going to Jerusalem, knowing what was going to happen, he says, I've got to go because I've got to complete what assignment I was given. I've got to finish. But then he summarizes his future in verse 25 down through verse 27. He says, Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel. Of God. Chip, how would you like to have someone say, we're never going to see each other face to face again? Especially when it's someone you love. Can you imagine that difficulty? Here it was, those whom he presented the gospel and led many to Christ, establishing the church in Ephesus. He says, now, I'm not going to see you anymore. You're going to be on your own from here on. Yet he has the courage to say, I'm innocent of your blood, of their blood, of your blood, because I proclaim that whole counsel. I have done what I was supposed to do. Now it lies on your shoulders. But the last part of this chapter is the part that we really ought to focus on. And that is Paul's warning of the future for the Ephesian elders. And I want you to notice, really, there are three things here. Number one, he encourages them to fulfill their duties as elders. In verse 28, he says, take heed to yourself. What does it mean when he says to those men, take heed unto yourself? Brethren, being in a leadership role in the church requires an inward search. It is something that they have to examine within themselves. And as he says there, Take heed to yourselves. Number one, look out for your spiritual well-being. Then he goes on in the second part of that verse, and he says, take heed among the flock. Not only do you have to look out for your own self, you've got to look out for all of those who are within the flock that you serve. 
Brethren, that is a great responsibility. And notice when he talks about the flock, he defines who the flock is. And we use this verse frequently. But notice he says, You take heed to yourselves and to the flock among whom which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. Well, to me, looking at myself, looking out for me, looking out for others, becomes all more important because you are looking out for the flock, the church, which Jesus purchased with His blood. But then continue on. Notice verse 29. He says, For this I know, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul says, There's coming a time when the savage wolves will come to destroy the church. I believe at this point in time, Paul is talking about the outside forces that are going to come. I believe he's referring to the Judaizing teachers of that day. Today we would say that those who have savage wolves who have come to destroy the flock are those some 8,000 plus different religious organizations that will not follow the inspired word of God. There are savage wolves among us today who want to preach salvation without baptism. They want to preach prosperity through the gospel. They want to preach all of these doctrines that are foreign to God's word. Paul gives a warning to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. It is coming you have to be prepared. That's why he told them to take heed. That's why he told them to continue to look and to study the scriptures. These savage wolves will come from without. But maybe one of the saddest verses in all scripture. And there are a lot of sad verses in the Bible, brother. But you notice verse 30? Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. What a self-fulfilling prophecy that has become. Even in the first century church, Paul says, even those who you count as your brethren are going to come in, and I will equate that back up to this fact, fact that they were savage wolves within the flock who had really never been converted. They're going to come, and they're going to seek to destroy the church, and they're going to draw away disciples after themselves. How sad that statement is. We see this every day in the church. We see it among God's people today. Brethren, it should not be that way. Verse 31. Therefore watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day it's not like these elders of Ephesus are just hearing about this. Paul says, I've been telling you for three years that this is going to happen. And brethren, we may be 2,000 years away from when this took place. But guess what? Guess what? Paul's words are still ringing true today. And we've been warned for a whole lot longer than the Ephesian elders have been warned. But yet, unfortunately, 
somehow, some way, we, and yes, we have allowed false doctrine to overtake many places in the, of the Lord's church. That is directly a result of not taking heed to themselves and for the flock. But then he goes on, thirdly, and he wants to address the coming apostasy. And I want you to notice what happens in verse 32. In verse 32, he says, I commend you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul commends them to the providential care of God. And in that providential care, it comes how? By the word. Our providential care comes because we read, we study, we put our faith in what the Word of God says. You know, we tend to be a people who like to speculate, do we not? And sometimes we like to bring up silly, dumb questions. Guilty as charged. And it all boils down to our opinion on a certain subject. Brother Gerald said it best this morning in our class, didn't he? Why does that matter? That's what we need to ask ourselves when we're dealing with something that we can't see in God's Word. We don't need to be reading into the, the, the story of the Bible. Let's take it for what it's worth. Paul is telling them, stay true to the word and you will be fine. And then look at verse 33 and 34. He says, I have come in no one, silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. Paul says, follow my example. Do not be in your position for gain. Be in your position because you love the Lord. Remember, look at verse 35. I like the end of the verse. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And then as you come to the end of the chapter, after the discussion had taken place, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them. Why did Paul kneel down and pray with the Ephesian elders? Do you believe Paul believed in the power of prayer? Paul is telling them about things that are going to happen. He knelt down to pray with them because he was truly, genuinely concerned about the early church. And specifically here, he was concerned about the church in Ephesus. But the reaction. Then they all wept freely, the Ephesian elders, and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. What a tearful departure. I don't believe the tears were all tears of sadness. Yes, I believe the tears were there because they knew they weren't going to see him anymore. But they were tears of gladness because of the message and the warning that Paul had given. And so as we close our lesson this morning,
from this tear from this discourse and this tearful departure, I believe there are many lessons we can learn. And we would do well to ask ourselves, how do we carry out our work, whatever our duties may be? Do we take the danger of apostasy, falling away? Do we take that seriously? Do we look to the Word of God for our answers? Do we remember what Jesus said about the blessedness of giving over receiving? Are we developing the kind of love that we see between the Ephesian elders and Paul in our text? Do we cry with one another? The Bible says we're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Do we do that? You see, brethren, we're in a day and in a time where we are being attacked on every corner, from every direction, but as a Christian, we can withstand all of the attacks by turning to God's Word. This morning, if you're here not a member of the body of Christ, and you need to begin having that ability to fight off the fiery darts that Satan throws at us, you can come with a heart that's full of faith, willing to repent, leave the way that you live life, begin to live the way of God, confess the sweet name of Jesus as the Son of the living God, be immersed with Him in the water of baptism. Have your sins washed away to rise and walk in newness of life. Or perhaps you've done that and you've allowed some of those fiery darts to penetrate the armor that you wear. And you need to come home repenting of sin and confessing those sins. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Because we all want to stand against the apostasy and the turning away from the Lord. This morning, if you have a need to respond, we pray you come while we stand and while we sing.